So Oberheim are a company that was originally founded in 1969 by Tom Oberheim. And after some effects processes and one of the earliest digital sequences on the market, Tom turned his attention to their first synthesizer product, which was the Synthesizer Expander Module, or SEM, or SEM, which is what these are. And the SEM still influences synthesizer design to this day. And throughout this video, I hope to shed a little bit of light on why that might be the case. Now, whilst the SEM was originally intended as an expander module for your Mini Moog or ARP 2600, Tom subsequently realized the potential to use them as the sound modules for a series of multi-voice synthesizers, the pinnacle of which was the trouser testing eight voice. <laughs> In the middle was the lip quivering four voice, but before either of those came the rambunctious little two voice. <laughs> So the first people we need to talk about are Emu Systems. The Emu Systems. So Dave Rossum and Scott Wedge provided two things that are on the two voice. Number one, the digital scanning keyboard, which is used to allocate the notes played to the SEMs. But number two is the oscillators. So prior to Dave Rossum designing the solid state music integrated circuits, Emu Systems had their own discrete designs, which is what you find in the EMU modular. And when Tom Oberheim came to EMU with uh, the SEM and needed circuitry designing for his oscillators, Dave Rossum designed some discrete oscillators for this too. The next person we need to talk about is Dennis P. Collin. The Dennis P. Collin. Of ARP Instruments, or Tonus Inc., as they were in the early days. Now, Dennis was an incredible engineer and was a particular master of filter design. He designed the 1047 multi-mode filter on the ARP 2500, and he wrote an entire paper on it if you want some light reading on a Tuesday evening. Now, the connection between ARP and Oberheim is that famously... In the very early days, ARP could not get retail stores to sell their synthesizers. They just didn't understand what on earth these things were. And so Tom Oberheim approached David Friend at a NAMM show, probably 1971, and said, hey, why don't I be your West Coast dealer? And after some consideration, they took him on. So for a while, if you were in San Francisco and you wanted an ARP 2600, you'd get it from Tom. Now, whilst they actually never met, Tom was able to license the multi-mode filter design he needed from Dennis P. Collin. And the result is the SEM filter, which along with the Moog ladder filter, is one that you see time and time again, uh, even in modern synthesizer design.
The next person we need to talk about is Jim Cooper. The Jim Cooper. So Jim was brought in to design a fair bit of the circuitry for the SEM, and he actually wound up then joining Oberheim and becoming their chief engineer for a while. He would have been there for the uh, SEM-based synthesizers, the OBX and OB1, possibly the OBX-A as well, but he left in the early 80s to pursue his own company, JL Cooper Electronics, embraced the potential for new digital technology, particularly MIDI. Uh, he was the president of the MIDI Manufacturers Association as well. Um, and his company still seems to be active now and seems to be quite prolific. But in his early days, he was working away on this. person I need to talk about is Tom Oberheim. The Tom Oberheim. So the SEM was Tom's idea. It was his concept. It was his layout. It was his feature set at the price point he was aiming for. Uh, and it's not random. For example, the two-pole state variable filter is there because the common synthesizers, the Mini Moog and the 2600, had four-pole low-pass filters, so it gave you a contrast, it has sync as well, which those synthesizers didn't have. So whilst it was intended to complement those synthesizers originally, it actually has become something in its own right. It had an all-star cast of engineers, which is why I think it's still so influential. And it kick-started the Oberheim synth story, which you know is a very significant one that is still unfolding to this very day. And what's really cool is that Tom has actually revisited both the SEM and the two voice in the last decade and a half. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll be able to twist his arm and get him to do it again. <laughs> So the final thing I wanted to do was just talk about three specific uses of the two voice in popular culture. Number one is with Mark Mothersbar. The Mark. Okay, I'm going to stop doing that now. Mark Mothersbar of Devo, but also of his composition house, Mutato Musica. Uh, he's scored many famous TV shows and movies. Uh, and in at least two interviews that I've seen, he states that he used his two voice all over the score for The Life Aquatic. And I hadn't watched that film in years, so I went back to it. And sure enough, mixed in with the orchestral instruments and the band instruments are all these little synth parts and actually some you know, complete synth interludes, which are 
Oberheim 2 voice. The next use is with Michael Stein and Kyle Dixon of Survive, who, of course, scored Stranger Things. Now, when the show first came out, there was lots of debate as to which synthesizer was playing the arpeggio in the main theme. And for whatever reason, the consensus became that it was the Roland Juno 60 or 106. Until Michael and Kyle did uh, an interview with Vanity Fair where they confirmed that it wasn't a Juno, they don't even own a Juno, and it was in fact their Oberheim 2 voice. And furthermore, rather than being an arpeggiator that's playing the arpeggio, it is arpeggiated the old fashioned way by hand. The final use I wanted to talk about of the two voice is with Jeff Barrow and Ben Salisbury. Now, in 2012, I think it was, they were hired to score what was then the new Judge Dredd film, Dredd. And they took an approach of doing a really minimal, dystopian synth score, very much in the John Carpenter and Alan Howarth arena. Uh, and they used Oberheim two voice all over that score. They've got three, I think, which is a lot considering they only made something like 500 of these. Now, for whatever reason, that score wasn't used on the film, um, but thankfully they were able to release it as a standalone album called Music Inspired by Mega City One under the alias Drock, with both those titles being references to Judge Dredd. So if you want to hear some unadulterated two voice in action, I've linked that in the description. So there we go, Tom Oberheim's first synthesizer, the SEM, and second synthesizer, the two-voice, uh, demonstrated. I hope this was interesting. Thank you very much for watching.